welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, what practical steps can we all take to avoid everyday racism and where might we go wrong? And I'm in conversation with Anne-Marie Christian. So my name is Anne-Marie Christian and I'm a social worker by trade. Um, qualified 24 years and been in the world of trying to child protection safeguarding since my late teens when my mother was a foster carer and for the first time ever I was exposed to um, young people who had different lives you know experiences should I say than I did um, and understanding that you know the whole kind of local authority social work kind of world um, and then I kind of that drew me into um, I, and I, th I think then I was a hairdresser anyway and beautician but I, I kind of was doing it around making people look better and then I went into the world of making people feel better in social work and child protection oh. so this is my degree blah, blah 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 and then it was more about the well-being and also understanding people with no voice and making them feel good about themselves regardless of what they've been through I think when I look back at my kind of moral compass and values that was always that one of those parts there and everyone's got a voice regardless of what you look like um and then yeah it led me to where I am today so um being a manager for 17 years and I was based in a school 21 years ago um, and I was a children and family social worker prior to that. Um, and again, I've worked with always in multiculturalism, always for my career. When I first qualified, um, you know, so where I am today, I'm an international safeguarding consultant and I travel the world talking about child abuse or raising the profile of child protection, should I say, um, knowing that in some countries it's very taboo, um, knowing that there's a lot of people who don't talk about it. Um, there's, you know, it, it, it's happening in everywhere. It doesn't discriminate boys, girls, everything. And I think, yeah, that's my passion. My, my, my vocation is about ensuring that people who work with others, including adults as well, are aware of people who are vulnerable and need that support. And current my message is, there's people that have been, will be, and are, you know, in that model. And I think that, you know, that's the model of, you know, people see the iceberg, don't they, of disclosures. And I think the reality is, we have to remind ourselves, that especially in COVID lockdown, I was talking to a colleague from Australia last week, and in some countries, it's rife where, you know, multiple kind of generations in homes, you know, children who, you, you know, might be seen on a daily basis or have an escapism from the reality of the abuse can't. So, yeah, COVID um, on top of all the other things that are happening is definitely a time for me now where it's frustrating, you know, in my little heart that I suppose I'm here to kind of today talk about what the kind of whole Black Life Matters agenda. So it's interesting, um, from March, I was involved with pre-safeguarding the whole um, COVID, what we're gonna do with this and that, and our supporting organizations. I work with safeguarding in sports, safeguarding in faith, safeguarding in arts, safeguarding internationally, and also community. So I'm quite familiar with all, hence my comment about knowing it doesn't discriminate. Um, and yeah, I was helping organizations in what will it look like now that we can't see people of concern or people who want to support you want to support and then with the may kind of agenda kicking in again it went to almost overnight to the well-being of people on top of that and in the uk um we spoke a lot about the bame black ethnic minority um you know groups and what it meant them being high risk for covid mm -hmm. and then it kind of went down to actually bame black and asian um two different things one's a color and one's a race um, and then we started talking about the reality. So when it first happened in, in America, people in the UK, initially people kind of say, well, it doesn't affect us at all. You know, we, we're here and they're there and we, we, we're fine here in the UK. We, we are multicultural and we do work with each other well. And then I think reflection, Stephen Rant, and lots of other things coming on, it, people reflected and then the voice came, actually, it's very similar. Actually, it, you know, it is here. And that's where I've been supporting organisations around thinking about what does it mean to us um, in the world we're living in, in, especially in England, you know, especially in England, for our colleagues. So I, I work with lots of organisations um, from very elite to um, aristocrat kind of organisations, you know, very kind of empire, colonialism, kind of British and proud, to local grassroots community groups, you know, um, and what does it mean for all of us? So today, hopefully, Puki, we're going to be talking about what that is um, based on our questions. Um, before we were just talking, can I show you my little dolly? Yeah, doll. go for it. I want to see your doll. <laughs> you have so, to describe your doll as well for those who are listening. I know, I know. 
So I was explaining to Pookie about, and Pookie and I have known her for many years, and I think we had a general conversation a few weeks ago, which is like, wow, we need to share this conversation because lots of people who are nervous or don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, and one of my roles, I'm a trustee for the Association of Child Protection Professionals, and I've done a lot of um, stuff there, but we did a webinar there, and I think I was talking to you about it there with colleagues and multidisciplinary about what language can we use? How can we support each other? You know, being kind of um, allies, etc. So I was explaining to Puki that um, I've got two children, two daughters, a 12 year old and a 16 year old. And um, when one, when the older one in 2006, I wanted to buy her a baby Annabella. Sorry for the advertising, but it was a little baby that you can <laughs> buy. Because at that time I knew I wanted a second child. So I was trying to get her with a, a pram and a baby. So when mummy has a baby, you know, it could be something that she's got one too. And all of them were peach skin. Um, couldn't get one and at the time I was a manager of a team and I said to my colleagues can anyone help me and, and they did and we went online and it took about two weeks to find a black baby Annabella um, and that's an example of where colleagues can go to a shop to buy a doll that reflects their child or can go to a card shop to buy a card where again family so I always buy cards and color them in brown for, Do you? You know, yeah, because I know growing up, you know, I, I know I don't get offended if someone gets me a card with, you know, with a kind of peach white person on it, but I know it's much more personal. So I know my husband, for example, it was Father's Day. So we got him a card um, from a, a, a person who now makes cards where before it was very difficult to find to get them online almost. Um, so, yeah, so um, I got the baby Anna, a Bella. Um, and it was fine and yeah so all those little things like I've just mentioned even plasters you know new plasters for years you wear plasters that are, that are kind of peach coloured and stand out they're not nude um, so little things like that so anyway I was explaining to Pookie that when I was 19 I went to America and I I loved cabbage patch dolls and the cabbage patch dolls were um, something where again it was a craze at school um and again they were all white dolls so when i went to america i bought my own <laughs> black cabbage doll so i know she's very dark and obviously not the same complexion as me and that's an example again there was only one color um, um and i was again it, there's still a thing there about different colorings of black people you know in relation to all types there's so many different shades of brown and i like going to schools where so this is monica i'll put her down there hello monica <laughs> <laughs> Anne-Marie's just showing her doll. For anyone listening to the, the audio podcast, that was a, a, a doll that was quite a different colour than Anne-Marie. I don't even know what are the right ways to describe those different colours. Uh... <laughs> so, so Monica was like a dark, if you think about chocolate, she was like a, a very dark chocolate, wasn't she? Think yeah. about digestive biscuits. She was, a, And I'm kind of more of a maybe lighter milk chocolate, would you say, or caramel? You know, it depends on, on, yeah, on the different okay. shades of brown. And that, that is one of the kind of challenges that I would normally experience in tights. So new tights for me aren't nude, you know. I normally would go for black denier, light black denier. But again, there's little things, I think, in this whole conversation around the reality of the world I'm living in, in the UK, or since being born, should I say, in the world generally. But again, how um, alive, my life might have been different to my colleagues, you know, like yours, for example, Pookie, we're colleagues, we know each other very well. Yeah. Um, we're natural friends, you know, we're natural friends. Um, um, and now we're having a conversation, but we're natural friends. It was never about actually, um, you're different to me. We've never had that conversation. It's never been a part of our conversation. Two women, we met, uh, you know, we're both doing something with a, an organisation where you're mental health, I'm safeguarding, we got on very well and we've been in touch since. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's why for my colleagues like yourself, we do have this conversation because they feel quite nervous sometimes. Like, uh, Marie, I have an email from a really powerful email from a colleague of mine who's a co worker I've worked with for about six years. And she was very apolog apologetic because she's very reflective, very the therapeutic person to mm -hmm. say she is something she never thought of. And now she's heard a lot about it. She appreciates that my experiences in the things we did together jointly would have been different to hers. Yeah. And she was yeah. right, you know, and, and I was able to have that conversation with her. I can empathise with that because certainly we originally um, were due to talk about a different topic, which we'll do later in the summer. But when we um, spoke earlier in the summer, this conversation, of course, came up. And I never and I don't mean this in a I don't see colour kind of way, because I know that's that's not the way that we're meant to look at this now. But I don't think of when I think of you, I don't think of you in any way as 
anything either than as my friend, if that's what kind of day it is, or as a safeguarding expert, if that's what kind of day it is. I just don't really think about whether you're tall or small or fat or thin or black yeah, or white. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't feel very relevant. But when um, we spoke earlier in the summer and we did begin to look, think about race and what like everyday racism might look like, um, I think I was quite surprised actually um, yeah just at how pervasive it is in your life um and that we live nearby to each other we have similar kind of careers but yeah your experience of every day is just really different than mine and yeah i guess i'm i feel like your colleague a bit ashamed perhaps that i never really noted that and i wanted to learn more that's fine that's fine and i think it's, it's little things like for example um again in understanding it um is um makeup you know like even just going, going to shop to buy makeup um or when we go on, I, I travel for a bit of a snob, apologies, only because <laughs> I just always have that. So I, I travel first class a lot, I do. Yeah. And that's trains and airplanes. And, and every time I go to a business lounge, I can guarantee that I do. It's a horrible feeling, even though it should be luxurious, but I do feel very, very excluded um, in that environment. And it's a weird thing to say. Um, so people who like you respect me from who I am professionally. Even you, I am that, and, I, and I, I do lots of things in my professional role. It's almost I'm treated differently until people um i introduce myself and then it's like oh you're Anne marie because my name is very ordinary isn't it very mm. kind of british until you see me i've been to gigs peaky where um person thought i was the administrator um <clears throat> to the point where i was doing the gig i was doing the kind of and it was a very aristocrat kind of organization um and there was a person there from a very well-established organization i won't even mention the name um and he was okay when i was sorting out my desk and my you know in preparation for the it on the day as soon as I introduced myself, he kind of was confused. I thought you were the lady from the office. I didn't realise you were doing it. Oh, you're Anne-Marie. Um, it was embarrassing, but I, I've experienced that quite a few times to um, people almost shudding you when you're lining up for something to go into a kind of, and then you go in and you sign, you get your kind of badge with speaker, and then they smile. Oh, you're Anne-Marie. So it's just interesting that once you're established mm. or you're recognised as that person respectively, then all of a sudden I'm, it's nice and you get smiles. But until then, you're just seen as someone who's not. So, yeah, it is kind of difficult at times. Um, and I suppose in, in our conversation today, it's about what can we do? What can I do to support colleagues listening right now <clears throat> who um, need to kind of a better understanding of it? And I've been invited to a few panels, Pookie, actually, <clears throat> for the next few months to talk about it in different places. Yeah. And I was talking to a, a, an international school about it and they were recognizing little things that they're doing, like, for example, um, the, um, the, the policy about hair. So my hair's curly today. My natural hair's curly. This is my natural hair. Mm -hmm. um, I blow, I, I, I know, but ordinarily before, I would rarely wear it natural because a lot of the work I do is quite corporate. Yeah. So, you know, being corporate, looking corporate is quite important, isn't it? Um, and over the lockdown, I've been very more confident now in, in wearing my hair curly and actually enjoying it and loving curly hair. And knowing that I can sometimes, I want to still blow dry it. But that's mm. another thing that you expect it to look a certain way, you know. And if you don't look a certain way, then you don't kind of fit into the organisation. Does that make sense? It and does I know, sense. yeah. For so some people might be hearing it thinking, no, but it's that's how it feels when, um, again, I, I'm very corporate in my style anyway. You know, you see me when I go to, you know, I'm talking, I, I, I dress the part. And, 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 and I get that. That's etiquette, isn't it? That's kind of what you expect it to do. And I suppose... We're living in Euro England, which is very Eurocentric, and and that's fine because that's just the way we dress. But when it comes to lots of other things, you're expected to be a certain thing. Do you know what makes sense? And when um, so, I talk. My mother, um, growing up in a household, my mother spoke very strong. Still does very strong Jamaican patois. Mm -hmm. So my my ear, you know, my first language would be if there's such a language, patois. You know, Jamaican patois. Mm -hmm. So I know when I'm more relaxed at home, I could talk loosely sometimes. Um, but when I go to work, I talk like this. <clears throat> so growing up, my, um, by default, I sometimes would go back to what my mother would say. And again, she, she didn't speak the Queen's English. <clears throat> and obviously her grammar would have been slightly different. So even though I've got my English O level, you know, I got there in the end. But the point was, I remember being at school and people not believing in me because I came from a different family. So I think we were called back then subnormal. Subnormal? So subnormal, yes. Subnormal was, so years ago, they had EMAG, the Ethnic Minority Achievement Grant. I don't know if you remember that back in the day, Pookie. It was a very kind of 80s thing, 70s, 80s thing, where 
children like me were seen as um, subnormal, basically. I've got books on it as well, um, reading up on it. And therefore, because we didn't talk or act a certain way, we were seen as not normal, hence subnormal. <clears throat> Did you know that? Did you, were you aware of that label? I was aware that when I was growing up um, in, in, as a, in, you know, in primary and secondary school, I was aware that the system, I remember feeling different when I was about four. Um, I remember flesh beryl pencils. I remember beryl, beryl pencils from yeah. school. And they had a, a, a flesh coloured beryl pencil. And I remember drawing, I've always liked art, and I remember drawing um, a picture of myself and was given the flesh coloured pencil. And I was only about four or five, you know, I think I was at the reception, I think then preschool, mm. whatever, but I remember it now. And if I remember it now, I'm like, gosh, it must've really affected me, you know, in mm. that bigger picture kind of head. And I also remember um, there was no, when, when you were given paper, you're only given white paper to do portraits on. And then I think after a while, when I got to like um, primary, top end of primary, I, I might draw myself in brown. And I did postgraduate, I remember doing a course on um, therapeutic um, work with children and art and play therapy. And I remember um, the first thing I did in, in the kind of self-portrait thing that you do, in, you know, in your kind of training was a big picture of myself, um, coloured it in brown, first thing. Uh, and I did a big red heart and I did this hair. And then I remember when, when you're analysing it, what came out was that was really strong, important to me. You know, my identity is really mm. important to me. Um, and my children, again, I was very, when they were younger, um, luckily now I'm, I'm a reviewer for them called Letterbox Libraries. But again, like I did for Baby Annabella, I had to find um, books that reflected children like me. Because my first black author was when I was 14 years old. Wow. An author called Rosa Guy from yeah. America. I remember that again. But I think now I want my children to grow up in a place where they can see people look like them. Of course. And the bizarre thing is, which is really interesting, my, my daughter, who's now 16, when she was two, I bought her a book. Um, and it's an ordinary book, like an early years book, going to the park, playing on the swings. But there was a, there's black girls in there, black children in there. It's a multicultural book, but black children too. And her colouring, you know, like mine. And I remember her saying, Mommy, look, that's me. And it almost oh. touched my heart and I got a bit tearful because that's what oh. I wanted. So they've grown yeah. in a world where they can feel important identity-wise and touch wood as, you know, as two young adults and teenagers in a, in, a, in a sense where they are now. They, they feel beautiful about who they are. Yeah. And that's so important because when I was growing up, you know, um, it was predominantly not that, you know, I was always made to feel the ugly duckling. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Always made to feel that because of the nature of billboards. Can you imagine being billboards? Everywhere you go, even I did uh, makeup, I worked in um, a few big department stores in London. All of the billboards, all of the pictures were of these glamorous white women. Not one looked like me. Do you and know, when you, so, you worked in beauty, I mean, were you working in beauty on... Was, was that kind of multiracial work or were you? No, so I worked for a, at a black American. It's interesting. It was late oh. 80s and I worked for a black American company who only did black makeup. So maybe naturally I went to that because um, I felt beautiful in it. And you don't make sense because they had, yeah. and then, then they had women who looked like me, but they were American. <laughs> fine, I'm fine with that. Um, and I remember big hair and the thing. It was lovely. Um, and yes, I started then to wear makeup. Um, and when I look at my old pictures, I was, you can see the, the difference in my confidence. I, and as a big one, I could look at that now, but at the time I, would, I didn't know that. I was still going through that journey. Um, and since then, I've always felt confident knowing that I could still have things that look like me. Do that make sense? Yeah. So now we've got lots of companies that do black makeup, which is, again, even the main ones, without mentioning any names, they, do a, they did a few selections, but they were very like three shades. Mm -hmm. And if you imagine there's loads of shades um, of, of, of black and white. Um, so now you can go to lots of different department stores and get makeup for all kind of types. But back then it wasn't the case at all. So, yeah, mm. it's just one of those things we take for granted again, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that kind of that everyday racism kind of thing. Exactly. As you say, simple stuff like buying a plaster or a birthday card or, yeah, your makeup, not being able to make those choices. But you think that your girls are in a bit of a different world than the one that you grew up in with regards to that? Do you think there's, there's most less definitely, of that? Most definitely, because they've also got black teachers. I didn't have any black teachers growing up. No black. I mean, my, my sisters or my, you know, my, my, my you know, brothers and sisters at home, I'm the youngest of eight. So I've always had older people who, who've been people who look like me, who are positive people, you know. Um, so for that, I suppose that was my inspiration in, in a way yeah. that they were successful and they were confident and they were quite corporate in what they were doing. So 
I always had that, but my children definitely know, yeah, they've, um, in their world, it, they, they can see people like them, you know, mummy and daddy are both role models, they've got decent jobs, you know, they go out, they're, they're, they're fine, they live in a lovely house, you know, so everything's fine for them, but for me, and also they've got multicultural friends as well, Yeah. so they've got friends of all types, um, but also they're confident who they are, um, even ones that start to wear makeup now, but she knows that there's shades that she can go to automatically rather than yeah. like me at the time, there was nothing there that matched my shade. Mm. So I couldn't, you know, I, I just couldn't wear makeup in that way, which was fine. I did eyeliner, but I couldn't wear powder or anything because they were too pale. Wow. And what are the things that you think that your girls need to be kind of aware of? Have you had anything that's kind of come to mind or discussions that have come up as a family as a result of this kind of recent kind of interest through the, the Black Lives Matter? Yeah, so my, um, it's interesting, my daughters, again, they're both at secondary now, but when they were at primary, they, because um, <clears throat> in my family, it's very in interracial. <clears throat> so my father's Asian, Indian, and on my mother's side, I've got German. Um, so we've got different shades in my family, and my sister-in-law is Irish. So they grew up in, a, and even my, nie my, my younger one, both her godparents are white women. <laughs> One's a very good friend of mine, English lady, and one's my sister-in-law. So, for example, being, therefore, they've never, you know, it's never been an issue, meaning their family are all. So, because of that, it's always been something, any family gatherings, we see black and white people, you know, yeah. and et cetera. So, it's never been a discussion and until now with the whole power imbalance and mm -hmm. the discrimination. Because until, you know, happy, jolly family times, but when it comes to the real world, they're now recognising, wow. So... Again, they recognise that sometimes people get treated differently because of, you know, or people are kind of, I would say demonised, but they can see how just because you've got a certain colour, does that mean the police are going to stop you? Mm. Um, you know, etc. So I've got a decent car. Um, touch wood, I've never been stopped by the police in that. So I remember, it's funny, last night I was thinking, I remember in my 20s, I used to get stopped by the police. Um, when I graduated, I remember I liked cars. I've always been, my, you know, maybe the, the Tom girl in me from having five brothers. I always liked cars. <laughs> and I used to buy decent cars that were affordable again, you know. And I remember when I first had um, a car, Audi, I loved Audi A3, and I bought it when I graduated after my, my little present to myself. And I remember again being stopped a few times in that car. Um, but, and looking back now, I remember thinking, how did it feel at the time? And it was it because I was a young black female in a car that they would have assumed I couldn't afford. Do you understand? Mm, mm. So yeah, so I suppose um, the world they're living in, they wouldn't have known that. But um, yeah, we've had conversations and they know that sometimes when I was younger, it was different for me than how it would be for them. Yeah. And we, and we told them that hopefully they're going to be in a world where um, there is no power imbalance and, and, and they can achieve anything they want to. And luckily in my family, I always had that. My mum's always been that person who said, the world's your oyster ran you know, go for it. If you don't shoot, you don't score. So that's always been my motto. And, you know, I've said that with my husband, same with my children. So they've got that kind of same value um, rather than what's the point because you're not going to do it because of discrimination. I've never had that attitude. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think your life experience has shaped what you kind of chose to do? Because you essentially are always championing the underdog and you're trying to make life fair for people. Is that a fair reflection? Yeah, definitely. I definitely, I, it's funny, <clears throat> until you analyse things like that, and it's only recently, I suppose, in that whole voice of not having, being invisible is a massive word for me, you know, I was invisible for many years, um, yeah. and at the time I didn't realise that until now as an adult, I know, does that make yeah. sense? So being yeah. invisible at school, I was invisible. In my first work, I was invisible. I remember people assuming I was an interpreter when I used to go to meetings and I first qualified as a social worker. I remember colleagues assuming that I smoked marijuana. I've never touched it in my life. Assumed mm. that I was a single parent. I had no children at the time. Wow. <laughs> Assumed that um, I went to a clappy, clappy church. Don't, you know, there were so many assumptions. And then even when black service used to, used to come in and I saw them as, as kind of relating to them as an experience of discrimination. And again, it's something that's just unspoken, by the way. <laughs> you don't talk about it with people. You just understand their journey. <clears throat> mm. The, the ones that were labelled troublemakers that police were called on before were fine with me. Mm. Come in, sit down, hello, talk to her, etc. And then I started getting allocated all the black cases. Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was interesting. And they were fine as in they weren't those labelled people anymore. They were people who were moving on, engaging. 
um, to the point they'd come in the office and look for me, etc. But the point there was people assume then, I'll never forget this actually, they assume that I was related to them. They would assume that I was their friend. No, they know them, but I just I respected them. And in social work, two principles, non-discriminatory practice and anti-racist practice and being non-judgmental. Mm. So for, I remember one lady, bless her little socks, I call her Miss A for this, that's not, you know, for this example. She, bless her, she came from um, another country, African continent. And I forget, yes, bless her, she was a maverick character. And she, you know, she was a person who potentially, um, if people didn't understand her, would think she had mental health issues. But she clearly was a very expression, a very heightened woman. Um, and I'll never forget one day we got a phone call to say that her children were running around naked outside and she was um, killing a chicken on the front door. So you can imagine, blue sirens. Roo, roo, roo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? It was, she, was, she was doing what she would be doing in Africa. So Caribbean African people you know, clean things. You know, our food are different in relation to how we, you know, how we process things. So she was washing her chicken, plucking her chicken on the doorstep. It was a hot day, and her children were running outside on the doorstep. She lives like in a cul-de-sac anyway. There was no... You know, and yes, they were naked, meaning they had like pants on, mm. but and she wasn't killing the chicken, she was just cleaning the chicken, i.e., washing the chicken in lemon juice and plucking mm. out the heads. You know, she actually bought the chicken, she didn't kill the chicken, the chicken was already bought from the shop, but we still yeah. go back and burn hairs, you know, upon the chicken. So that's an example of mm. there was no drama, and actually, she wasn't sectioned because she wasn't Nothing. crazy. Yeah. yeah, so that's an example. That's an example of how then they saw me as colluding. And actually, I just saw what I saw. You know, or when she'd come in and she was really wound up, she was a lady frustrated because she wasn't heard. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at the kind of layers of it all. So, yes, I suppose in every role I had, there was an element there of, and in this particular borough, I remember people saying to me, don't work there because they're very, they're quite a racist borough. I remember, and it didn't put me off because my mother's motto again was, you don't shoot, you don't score. Yeah. Um, and I made it, and I was the only black person in that team for about seven years. Wow. Um, and again, I'll give another example. This is funny. I, this is an example again of experience you're going to like. I, you pookie being pookie, I can tell you. So <laughs> back then, a lot of the girls on the team were single, including myself. And it was, I know, and it was a lovely place where there's a lot of nightlife and bars down the road. So we used to go there after work. Um, anyway, there was a new um, person, uh, a colleague who's uh, in another. Um, it was her teacher from a school who'd um, in one of our on our patch who'd um, just started, and he was a dish. Um, I think he was a bit dishy. He was, he was a cute <laughs> guy. So all of the girls when he when he used to come into the office for meetings from you know about children at the school, they'd do themselves up, blah 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 blah, and, and they'd all push themselves up. <laughs> it was quite funny, you know, in that way. So and I was like this kind of side expression, but you know, like black sheep, the person that wasn't ever considered as anything. And what was so interesting was they all used to do that, push themselves up and being the beautiful blonde they were and everything else and being seen as beautiful in that way. And I was this person who was not seen or considered. So anyway, it was fine. Um, and we had these meetings, et cetera. And I would be in these meetings with him, et cetera, because it was like a network meeting, et cetera. Um, and being myself and et cetera. And I, I'll never forget the day when um, I went to meet in his school and I wasn't chasing him like they were, the way, but he was dishy. <laughs> um, and, um he said to me something he made a comment um he made a comment that suggested he understood black black women it's quite interesting it's funny because it's those black women or black people when we have a bath or shower we have to cream our skin because our skin gets quite dry or it looks gray so on that day i remember wearing shoes and i think um i had a bit of dry skin on my on my leg and he said you haven't, you haven't creamed your skin today i was like oh and wow i was a bit embarrassed but he said it in a joke way like ha ha and I was thinking, oh, he understands black women then. I mean, until then, I just thought, you know, so again, if it's my stereotype thinking, oh, here we go, blah, blah, blah. Thinking just another, guy, another person I'm working with that my colleagues really adore. Um, and then he, he said, we must do lunch one day. And actually, it's very interesting that he then invited me for lunch. <clears throat> and I was surprised because I fed into that whole thing of what they're into, as in, I'm no one to be considered. And they're all the beauties. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That's an example of, again, yeah. where... It was the laugh was on me in the end, and I didn't eat it for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but the example was they would never have thought that, and up to this day they'd never know that because I never told them. Wow, and that's interesting though. So that was partly about how you were perceived by others, but that sounds like it was as much about your own perception of yourself as. I, and do you know why? Because 
in ordinary times, when you go out there, um, you, you, and this is where the white privilege comes in, you see white people all the time and you expect white people, again, I know there's, so people who are friendly to me, and I don't mean this in a very, you're horrible and you're friendly person, but I just mean when I go out ordinarily, say mm. like, um, forget social, like go to work or yeah. I get on the train or I go to a conference and I'm sitting in the audience. People who, people who kind of naturally sometimes sit around me are, are cool, as in they make me feel comfortable, they smile, they greet, hi, you all right, how are you? Yeah, fine. And then there's people who don't, who completely exclude you, okay? So I, you can always tell the sort of people, the I play white people who, who are used to, um, who've grown up with or well-traveled to know that I'm, I'm just another person rather than she's a black person. Do you know that sense? So going back to that example, um, and, I, and over the decades I've learned more about that, but um, I used to put people in a pigeonhole where I assumed that people um, wouldn't understand black people. Yeah. Because the way they made me feel told me you didn't. So until you've come and approached me, like you, for example, we got a naturally regardless. Yeah. So I knew that you, you were a person that you're very multicultural and, you, you, and, and to you, you've got people of all types because I was just another of a female that got on well with you. You know, yeah. there's nothing about colour there. Yeah. Compared to some people who I could tell that are not used to being next to kind of black people and don't know or nervous or actually say offensive things mm -hmm. in span. So again, over the years now, they stand out a mile. The ones who are more comfortable and inclusive, fine. You understand? Um, and, and, I, and even when you go on outside, that's what, you notice that straight away. Then the first three seconds, you can pick up on someone who relates to you as a person. Hence the word person. Yeah. And it's all that. So a message today would be, you know, relating to that person as a, as a woman, as a mother, as a professional, as a colleague, full yeah. stop. And then understanding her, that my story being different because of the colour I'm in, that the world perceives me. It's interesting. I did some training for a massive fostering agency, um, Fuki, last. I go there every year to do my annual bit, but there were all these, it was in Kent. Mm -hmm. Deep heart of white Kent, yeah? <laughs> the real Kent and 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 again I popped up being Emery oh okay and then uh, and then within half an hour they realize I'm a bit crazy and she's funny ha ha rather than oh um I see people like you on the paper and um oh I'm not sure about you I uh, believe me I could sense that to the point then at the end I twisted it round and we did a bit about unconscious bias and um I said to them so what do you see in front of you and one of them would say black woman fine because I was trying to make a point of you're going to have children who are black placed with you and how will they feel in your organize in your home? You understand? Mm -hmm. And what was interesting, they all are all inclusive and don't see race. However, they weren't aware, or until this day, or considered that their neighbours would see would see the colour more than them. I see. You understand? So yeah. when that child goes into the town, they're going to be seen differently compared to how they feel in that home. I see. So as a foster carer, they had a responsibility to think not only about their own uh, perception, but the perception of the people around them. Of the yeah, children. definitely. Definitely. And, and the experiences for that foster child going into town, you know, and how that would feel. Because that's something, again, you, we've learned to internalise it. And, and, yeah. and that sounds terrible saying it. Yeah. It does sound terrible saying it. And, and I think until now, I've internalised so many things because it's almost one of those things that you just have to I wouldn't say deal with, it's just part of life. Yeah. But we're not educating people around us to understand that we're internalizing and what we're internalizing. And I think that's a massive thing about Black Lives Matter at the moment is we're able to have a voice. Yeah. Do you feel though, like I wonder a little bit with the, the situation at the moment, like do you feel a pressure to be the face of, because there's not loads and loads of people in your kind of position who are black, who can speak up for, do you know what I mean? Do you, do you yeah, feel a responsibility yeah. to speak you know, up for, for people of colour? Or I don't know what right. words you want to use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I, I feel I'm quite, uh, without, the word privilege for me means I've got, an, I've got a platform. That's the only privilege yeah. I would have in this, the platform. So when I do public, I've been, it's interesting, last night again, my reflection moments, mm -hmm. I've been in keynote speaking for 19 years, since 2001. And in all those, and when I thought about it, I thought, wow, in all of those conferences I've done, or keynotes, etc., I've only seen um, <clears throat> about a handful, think about 20, 19 years, a handful of black speakers. Really? Yeah. So 99% of the time, <clears throat> and all of those 19 years, I would have been the only black, black keynote speaker, okay? Wow. In England, this is obviously, 
because internationally it's slightly different but even then i'm again normally the only black speaker but going back to that message then at the moment um i've been brave enough in some of those opportunities i have because of the platform i'm in to make comments about it comfortably that people can have a conversation because some people have got this kind of thing where because i know if i got upset and, and 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 reacted to some of the things i experienced i'll be seen as a, an aggressor black woman with an attitude mm. and one thing i've been talking about recently I, I, on a lot of my other forums has been um this year i was going to bristol can't remember why one of my gigs i suppose and i was at paddington station on the concourse um and a lady dropped a beautiful pashmina on the floor i, I love scarves um you know i clock them all the time because i love scarves so I, and i knew it was, a, it was a well expensive one so i picked it up to give it to her and then she turned around and she almost screamed and jumped like to say hey leave me alone oh, you know like i was making her sort of thing the point i'm making is I'm, my handbag was worth more than I mean, i'm not bragging but you know one of those things when actually not really bragging a little bit <laughs> <laughs> all right I'll, i'm making but the point i'm making is really you know you know my, my wallet is worth you know it makes sense so the point i'm making is people have just seen this and a white lady shouting rather than actually i've given her her lost scarf but no one else was, was, was uh, done that was the point and i was dressed appropriate as in even does that matter but i was dressed like i was going to work I had my briefcase with me, et cetera, suitcase, et cetera. But that's an example, again, of I can talk about that. Um, and people who know me would think I've got a good heart. They know I would just yeah, be of kind of caring rather than trying to take the lady's scarf. So you're using your platform to try and actually open up some of these pretty thorny conversations at the moment. But you are one person. And as you say, you, you're not experiencing much diversity in those kind of lineups. So actually, that makes me think, well, then what's the role of like, me and other people with white skin to try and promote this agenda as well i mean is it right for me to do that what what's my role here you know it's interesting so um <clears throat> two things um the first one was language so I mind that language in a minute okay the second thing you're saying here is about um understanding the experiences of okay so yes i'm um i so i my identity is it varies depends what mood i'm in I yeah. might be called like to call black woman or woman of color or black British. It really depends what mood I'm in on the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, with language, it depends on, so think about how you pronounce a name. Okay. Um, it's quite personal, isn't it? You know, like I know you, you grew up in, not in, in London, you grew up in a different part of the, of the country. And again, maybe you identify like that sometimes or not, you know, it all varies, isn't it? Depending on, yeah. on that day, how you feel. Yeah. So there I saw you, made a quote about your cider or something, didn't you? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> so I know for me, again, that really depends on how I feel at the day, a lot of things going on for me. Um, and I think going back to, you, you know, what you just mentioned there about people like yourself and Andy Lennox did a really good clip that I showed at another gig where she's been interviewed by Dr. Shola. Um, mm -hmm. And Dr. Shola has done a lot in the press at the moment about this. And she was saying about, Andy Lennox was saying, what can I do, like what you're saying, to help? You know, I want to be part of it. But am I welcome? And, and, and Dr. Shola says, of course you are. You know, you, you know, you are an ally in it as well, meaning you could help us and give us that kind of platform mm -hmm. of um, helping us to challenge the racists. So helping us. So you're, you are one of us because mm -hmm. you you're including and you're using the privilege to, you know, help challenge people who've got the same privilege as you yeah there's a really powerful clip at the moment um picture of marilyn monroe i've seen it with ella fitzgerald yes that if she sat in the front of her gigs then yeah, yeah yeah and you know what this sounds really weird but that's i felt that a few times so i've got a few colleagues one that we both met through and i met her about <clears throat> about six years ago <clears throat> and again she's given me that she's my marilyn monroe oh. she's exposed me to lots of organizations that i wouldn't have had in that shadow i would have been in yeah so, yeah, do you know what makes sense? So yeah. again, until I'm recommended to somebody, and again, my name is plain, the night they see me, oh, okay. I work for quite a few, a few big um, independent organizations with the kind of aristocrat lot as well. And I'm, I'm an ordinary name, and they introduce me by email, but when they see me, it's like, well, okay, didn't realize that. But again, I, I get used to it. But the point being, I suppose, um, I suppose in, in, in helping people to understand it, I, I, that, you know, that picture I was just talking this morning before you kind of start recording, Pookie, about the young black white girl looking in the shop window with black dolls. There's hundreds of black dolls and there's white girls looking in. And, and, and that's a reality, I suppose. The reality is, how does that girl feel? And I had a, one of my daughter's friends 
mum said to me the other day, I had to drop her off on a play date the other day. And she goes, Anne, I saw something on telly the other day. And I thought, oh my God, now I know how you feel. And it was a picture of, it was um, a group of black women out and there was one white lady there. And she said, wow, Anne, you know what? Until I saw that, mm. now I'm realising what this is all about. Do you understand? So for some people, there's going to be a few triggers that's going to make them realise, oh, you know, a bit like if any of you've been to Africa or Caribbean or um, Asia, where you get off the plane and you're the only white person in this land. Yeah. yeah? yeah. That, and, you know, that, that's what it's like for us in, in that way. And, and like what you said, I'm not the voice for all. I'm only going by my own experiences. I know some black people who hate the word coloured. Because, and I get that because colour, coloured is a word I don't like either. Woman of colour is different than coloured. Because coloured we know is kind of linked to slavery trade, etc. Um, and even still, we will never have power. So the whole thing about racism, discrimination, is the power that comes with people of, 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 of an organisation or of, of the institute, of the empire. You know, so white people seen as being superior, yeah. you know. Um, and and I, I get that across the world in other places as well with the kind of countries they've been to. But yeah, there is a sense always that we're not as good as white people, you know, or um, if you say anything, it's because you've got a chip on your shoulder. So you can never get it right rather than diplomatic. Because I'm quite a diplomatic person. So when I experience things like that, I don't get angry. I feel sorry for those people. You know, it's a bit embarrassing. Uh, I remember years ago, um, about 30 years ago, being out with my brother. And my brother used to love Michael Jackson. Um, he used to do moonwalk. We were at a wedding, I think. And this little white boy comes along and do moonwalk with him. He said, oh, anyway, I can't talk to you because you've got brown skin. And he ran <laughs> off. So there's a lot of little things that you hear along the way. Um, you know, even I know nursery two years ago, and this is like my safeguarding role, two incidents of white children saying, you've got brown skin, we can't play with you. So with Brexit, people don't appreciate this Black Lives Matter thing actually got worse before, before COVID. So Black Life, you know, the, the Brexit triggered tension in the UK yeah and I saw that in my work I definitely saw that in my work with kind of the well-being of people and the, in the increase of extremist groups growing and the tension and even you know we live near each other I went to my local supermarket and because I'm now more clued up, clued up with training I've been on around extremism even in my updates during Covid um, I noticed a sticker on the, um, the car park fine and I ran up to it I took a picture because it was quite small and it was actually a bright a white extremist sticker in my local oh, no. supermarket. So what? I thinking, and I was a car park as well, I was an underground car park, I'm like, whoa, I'm really a bit scared now. And that is my local supermarket that I go to wow. every Wow, that's week. really interesting. See, I always think that one of the things that I think is better for my children than, than for me, you know, I grew up in Devon where I think I've, I've told <coughs> you before, I looked up the Ofsted report of the junior school that I went to and there was of 500 children, one black kid, and she actually wasn't there for long she was um I think she must have been in foster care and I remember that she was given all sorts of nicknames because of the color of her skin but she was like the first black child that any of us ever interacted with and I, I my assumption is that maybe she was removed and you know went somewhere where she perhaps had mm -hmm. a bit more of a mix um but yeah so I grew up in a very very white place but my children are growing up in Croydon and they have a whole range of different kind of colour of friends and um, all sorts of different sorts of friends of, of, of all type and, and I think that that is one of the nice things that does come for them of, of living in Croydon you know one of their um, very best friends is um, is is mixed race and they have interesting conversations around now they're getting a little bit older my girls are 10 and they talk about hair and stuff and I remember when, uh, when their friend came to stay and I have no idea how to manage her hair she came yeah 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 it was, yeah, it was really, yeah, yeah. really hard. Um, but we had great fun learning together and we were able to do that in a, yeah, I don't know. It, it felt like a really natural and a nice way. And my girls were able to be inquisitive about it and we were able to explore and talk to her uh, mum uh, about, well, how, how do you manage this kind of hair and the products and, and, and that kind of thing. But I think, yeah, I think that's nice for my kids that they're in this much, yeah, much more diverse environment. But it sounds like, yeah, maybe that, it doesn't feel so diverse for you and that there's still that undercurrent of racism. Yeah, Because even like going back to mixed race, um, there's, well, I remember a book I reviewed years ago for Letterboxd and it was like, my mother's an alien. It was actually about a mixed race child whose mum was white. Uh -huh. And compared to this little brown girl, her yeah. mum was white. You know, uh -huh. So you could be in, in it. So looking at it, you know, I could have been the girl, you could have been my mum. Uh, yes. <clears throat> you know, so my identity and my role model would have been a white person. And and that's happening i've heard quite a lot of that at the moment again the invisible race being mixed other and you know people who uh, again um 
I know my daughter's friends the same in, the, in that she's half Asian. So in the, win, in the summer, she gets a, a decent brown tan. Yeah. Um, and she, again, her parents have seen a different experience they have with her in the summer than they would have done in the winter. Oh, so wow. we're learning so much at the moment around um, what it means for those individuals and how people perceive things. Um, and I suppose, again, a test that I think, and this is, again, my, my Amory personal thing is, if, if you, well, one of the first things to check as an individual is, outside of work, have you got any friends who don't look like you? Oh, good question. Okay. Do you make sense? Because I, yeah. I know I have. Yeah. And I know we're crazy, you know, and, and that's fun. Um, and I've always had that. And, and, and I can see my nephews are the same and, and my, my children are similar. Does that make sense? Um, but I could argue my, my older siblings don't have that as much as I've got it. <clears throat> um, you know, and it's 12 years distance between me and my, my older sibling. But in, in all my life, I've, my, 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 you know, my, my best friends at school have, have been white. Mm -hmm. um, at college were white, at uni were white. You know, so I, I get on with all and actually better sometimes i say better meaning naturally personalities yes. nothing about color um and i've got a mixture of all types of friends from black asian white you know sexuality as well so i've always been that very person about the person maybe it's like you said in my vocation about seeing the person within everything else mm. um and i think that's one of the first tests i think again is that for yourself if you're listening and, and thinking what does that mean for me have i got any friends who don't look like me you know who, you know outside of work and if not why not and if you haven't, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means, why has that not happened? So check on your unconscious bias about that sometimes. Because sometimes, I remember years ago in the 90s, I was dating a guy in America, and I think early 90s, I was going, um, and my uncle, I was, um, used to go stay with him in New York. And he used to say to me, um, and again, being the person I was at the time, very multicultural with my friendships. And in New York, he used to say, oh, Anne, you know, won't bore with an accent, but he said, we have white people on the job but I don't mix, we don't mix out after work. And he was very clear about that. And I thought, I thought that was a bit weird. I thought it was a bit weird. Um, but when I look, I think there was a research thing a few years ago in the Metro um, Vicky about London being a melting pot, but actually it's a false, it's a false hope of such a word because actually we don't mix after work. We're not genuine friends. We know people, but we don't mix after work. Do you understand? Yeah. Um, you might have your... And don't get me wrong, you don't have to have co coffees or drinks with people, just have friendships with people. Mm. So I know I've got people like you, there are people I've got friendships with who I can know that, yes, I have got that reflection. Mm. It's just little things like that of, does that mean you, you generally don't give people opportunities to kind of um, be your friends? Or yeah. have you got your unconscious bias that you put them in pigeonholes? It's interesting how you categorise people, though, see, because I was thinking about it like, as we've been talking. And I mainly, my friends tend to be men. But of all the females that I'm friends with, colour and ethnicity has got nothing to do with it. But they're all universally really strong women. So actually, my friendship group of women isn't especially diverse. Yes, it is in terms of ethnicity and colour. But in terms of type, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, like I have, yeah, remarkable women in my life, but only remarkable women, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, if, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But yeah, and I think maybe there's room for a bit more diversity in, in other ways as well. But yeah, it's really interesting. What do you think should be the other things? Like, you know, as a parent, it's making me, me wonder what are the things that I need to be doing for my children to make sure that I'm getting this right as a mum? I think it goes back to, again, um, positive role models of all. So, for example, books, um, but also films, watching like hidden figures, you know, things where they're going to see black people in a positive experience rather than slaves or maids or, you know, mm. I mean, I've worked with Roots, you know, Roots wasn't great for me. Yes, it was a reality of what happened to my ancestors, etc. But in school, it's sort of almost ignored. So I'm glad now we're in a point and my children know about black history. So they know that actually about Mary Seacole, they know, you know, all the things about the things about the Jamaica or the Caribbean. Um, they know about the wind rush, you know, they know all of the people who fought in the war. So when we mm. see D-Day, B-Day, you know, all that, we, we also see our own people who are part of that, not, not, not represented in the, in, in the day to day. Does that make sense? So yeah. they already can see slight discrimination because they're not included in. Um, so I think it's little things where you make a point of um, ensuring that you, you know, your children can experience different types of other children, you know, mm. and if, I've had emails from colleagues from the Cotswolds, for example, saying, oh, I want to, you know, make my, our children more inclusive, but we're living somewhere where we can't. What can I do? And again, it's about introducing in your home the films, the resources, the books, the conversations. Um, I've had people through training say, 
I'm, I'm scared of black people. Why? Because when I grew up, we didn't mix with black people. Well, okay, well, are you scared of me then? And they pause, meaning I seem okay, but they might be scared of me because I might switch on them because we're, we're in their family or in their lifestyle, they read papers where people who look like me are seen as criminals <laughs> or immigrants. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So this whole thing about immigrants, like, you know, I think my daughter said to me, <clears throat> so why is it in when English people go abroad, they're seen as expats, but we're seen that other people come over immigrants. It's really You know, like language. There's certain little languages that, and I couldn't answer her, to be honest, but there's little things that sometimes just feels a bit more negative. And why um, is immigrant a word with negative connotations anyway? Like, I think it's the media again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's the media, the media making it immigrants coming over, not accepted foreigners. You know, this whole foreigner thing? Mm -hmm. And I still get that sometimes, even on British Passport. You know, where you, the thing about where you really from, British, British Passport. No, where you really, really from, I'm black British. And sometimes I sit on there deliberately thinking, I'm going to make it hard for you because I know what you're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, does it doesn't really matter. And that, if so, and why? You know, this whole thing about the, the tray of eggs being different shades. You yeah. know, we've got joke in them. So I think for anyone today, it's just them making, being reflective on the next time they see a person of colour, again, we're all individual people. Mm. Okay. And therefore, in order to engage with that person, you, they need to feel connected. And I, I read a comment at the start of Black Life Matters that really kind of, I could kind of relate to. And it was, it feels like being in the same space, but there's no connection. Oh. That's what it feels like in how you, racism feels. And, and the connection is, again, where um, you have no power. So no matter what you say, you're not being heard. You're invisible in there. So it's like being invisible in a room where there's other people. That's what it feels like in, in everything we do. Um, that's yeah, that's how it feels. That's how it feels. And not, not all the time, but the, when we do experience it, that's the feeling we get. And do you ever feel any kind of uh, guilt, I guess, about the fact that you do have the privilege of often having the stage and holding people's attention, perhaps in a way that not everyone does? Um, Sometimes it feels like a bit of pressure because I have people look at me representing the race and I don't. I only represent Anne Marie and my experiences. Yeah. And, and, and everyone's, got, so some people get annoyed. Some people, some black people are annoyed with me to think, um, you know, I need to tell the real story. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm a personality, so we're all our own individuals. So I'm giving you my account and my account is still worth something compared to, and, and so with the other person. But the story is, everyone's got their own story. So it's yeah. hearing different stories. And the pressure I would have is, Again, um, some people think I'm too polite about it, as I said. But <laughs> my experience have been different because, yes, I'm, I've, I've experienced racism 100%. However, my values have been different because my mother's installed in me, yeah. you're worth more. Do that make sense? So I didn't have installed in me, you're black, therefore you're never going to be successful. I've never had that installed in me. I've had installed in me, the world's your oyster, go for it. And I've used that in my journeys through my life. Hence, I had these opportunities. But it has been challenging. It has been very challenging being the only black person a lot of the time in lots mm -hmm. of things. And I still do that now, you know, being a speaker for things, the only black person when I, all my other colleagues um, aren't. Um, or being a chair of, sometimes I chair panels. Yeah. Again, as in at conference, I might be the chair. And again, not having the same status, even though I'm the chair, people kind of don't respect my decision sometimes. Yeah, do you ever get positive discrimination where people are perhaps you know where because we are trying to perhaps be a bit more i don't know forward thinking in terms of race and ethnicity when making up panels and things do you ever feel that you're there and people are inviting you know like, i sometimes feel this i will get invited because of um i'm autistic or that oh, i have you mean tick about yeah, my mental yeah, health yeah, yeah and yeah. i don't want to be there for that reason yeah, i want to be yeah. there because i'm an expert in my field i i, I would say it's interesting because of my profession and my professional role. No, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So I know it's always been safeguarding. Yeah. So if I get a sudden increase in now, I say, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, another thing I'll quickly share with you when I, I went from being a school based social worker, um, and, um, went to managing a bit massive role in the local authority, you know, when my salary jumped up by you know, 10, 10 grand increase and then sort of, and then sort of roles when you kind of go from an ordinary to a, a, a senior role. And in that role, I forget, um, so I'm yet to go to an interview <clears throat> where there is a black person on the panel, by the way. That's just never. 
I think honestly, maybe one, and that, and I'm, I'm thinking, but you know, meaning one out of many. Wow. So um, I've got this job. It's funny. I've got this job. It's just weird. I've got this job, and other lots of um, other people went for the job, and I got the job, and I was the younger one and the only black one. So in starting this job, the first day, I'll never forget, the director of this person, local authority took me to lunch. It felt really weird. So I went to lunch, and I was a nobody, meaning I, you know, didn't, new to the borough, da da da. Went to lunch in this beautiful part of you know where it was, um, having our kind of lunch that you do, etc. Did not to say, you can imagine, you know, airs and graces, etc. Awkward, yeah. Yeah. So did this role, and um, after a while, you know, what it felt like to me, you know, like it's it's, quite, it's not even funny, but in, in thinking about it, it's quite it's quite amusing. You remember Trading Places, Eddie Murphy? Mm, mm. I really felt like I, it was Trading Places. I really felt that I got the job, and I was managing a lady who could have got the job, who who was more of that white middle class kind of kind of thing, who didn't get the job, and she, therefore I was her manager. So, you know, trading places, but mm. I and I had the power and, and the job and she didn't. And for a while, I felt like I was this person who had privileges like Eddie Murphy did in trading places. Yeah. yeah. Um, and make decisions. And he went to all these board meetings and looked apart. Um, and, I, and, I, and looking back, I think, again, I know I got the job because I had more experience compared to my colleagues. Yeah. yeah. However, I, it felt like Eddie Murphy time. It felt like I was kind of like mm. trading places. Does that make sense? So yeah. sometimes, if you think about white privilege, Trading Places, again, is a, math, is a good film to start, isn't it? In mm. how he felt. Yes, don't get me wrong, he was known to the police, etc., and for the shoplifting. It's a different event, isn't it? I get it. But when he did get that whole experience of these people, again, it was only over a dollar, but his lifestyle is exposed to. And then he became friends with the person. But that's an example of how colour and race um, and status impact how you're perceived outside. Yeah, and that you have to work almost that bit harder for the same. Yeah, you do, you do. And I think, going back to your original question that you just had about, um, sometimes I do feel a bit tick boxy, sometimes. Mm. But because safeguarding, I only get invited to safeguarding things. Yeah. Does that make sense? So therefore, yeah. I fit the role. And you um, are just the best person for it. I mean, that's it. You oh, are always you. the person I pick the phone up to. <laughs> Um, when thank I'm you. yeah when I'm struggling and and also I think it's not just that you have that expertise on so many levels but that you always tell it straight and I think I have huge respect for that I know that if I've got something wrong you'll just tell me which not everyone does and I get you you probably get that too that when you work relatively high in your field that you don't get much constructive criticism always and yeah 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 thank you thank you for that I respect that as well yeah yeah thank you yeah. um but yeah and I do find that as well what you comment you just made as well um, but I think the, um, yeah, I've been invited, it's interesting, so away from my safeguarding role, I've been invited to a few panels going forward about, um, I'm part of the Baymed Network, if none of you don't know it, it's a, you know of it, it's a panel, it's a basically a place where a lot of people can now know they can go to get black professionals yeah. who are worth their field, um, and they happen to be black rather than people not knowing. Um, and I've been invited to speak at a few about, about black, my, about the whole experiences of and what can organisations learn from it? Yeah. You know, so that would be a tick box. But I'm in a way where actually we're having a conversation like we are today. So yeah, it's yeah, rather than yeah. only. And I think but you know what? Okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry, go on. Another quick thing. I, I read an article at the start of this. I think I told you in our first conversation, um, written by a person who I read something about racism and safeguarding. Okay, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, a good article. Read it. And I, it, was, it touched the size, but it wasn't a, a real in-depth kind of conversation. It's by a very good organisation I've got a lot of respect for. And I know them very well. And I rang them and said, you know, wow, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm in your email. Um, you've emailed me regarding this article, but I felt that you really missed the point here and you've got a massive audience. Point being, I spoke to the person who wrote it. The person who wrote it is a female, white lady, white privilege. Um, she wrote it and I spoke to her about it. I said, that's great. However, um, She's married to a person who's not British, therefore her name reflects um, a non-British person, but she's bright British. Um, she, told, she spoke about an experience she had when someone assumed that she was of that country, being in Europe, mm. um, until she opened her mouth, and then the, the sigh of relief that they had when she, they realised she was English. Okay? Mm. So in, even in that conversation, it's fine, but she didn't get the point. The point I was making was, um, I was thinking, can a, um, a man write about sexism of a woman? Mm. You know, can a, a a tall person write about being short? Can <laughs> a skinny person write about obesity? So when it comes to this, and I don't know the answer to be honest, Pookie, but I'm just putting it out there. As yeah. far as people, 
And don't get even like a white woman who's got a mixed race child. Can she experience the same life that her child will? Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. So but then maybe she should try. Yeah. And, and, so, and I've, I'm, I've experienced both. I've experienced some women who really do when they're on it and they're challenging it. Like my, my, um, my daughter's godmother is one of those people. You know, she mm. grew up, you know, from her childhood in places of a West Indian community. So she kind of has grown up where people discriminated against and her child is also part of that. So she kind of really gets it and yeah. will challenge all the way. And her son's got a very good insight into that and very successful too. Mm, mm. Compared to some where it's been a bit of a tick, tick box where they're, they're there, but they're not emotionally involved yeah. because they're in love. They, all, they love each other and love is lovely, but love doesn't kind of highlight the experiences that people that you love are experiencing. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, so, it, so I think having a courageous conversation and, and making sure that we're listening and understanding, because if you start with that, then you, you can turn the next page together if, with an understanding of that person. Yeah. And language is important as well. So making sure that if you are working with people of, of difference, again, like you would for a non-binary person, really, you know, all those sexuality things where what how shall i you know what, what how can i what should i refer to you as you know in a way that what how would you prefer me to pronounce your name or how would you prefer me to identify you as you know in, in your ethnicity so i think all the little things are just like you would ordinarily but saying it because then that yeah. person's given the kind of um responsibility to say it's about you so be curious yeah. i guess isn't it be courageous and be curious and don't be afraid to ask questions feels quite important yeah, and, and I think inclusion is a massive one. So mm. if you go to the basics of another, that's another female, that's another male, that's another mother, mm. you know, rather than a black person. Yeah. So I think it's just trying to remove it. But then going back to remembering the ethnicity is a factor that is going to shape the experience of the person's life. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to remember the discrimination that person's also faced. Because yeah. that's not going to help. So what I'm saying here is, in summarising, I'm trying to think the message I'm going to give out is, yes, they're a person. However, their life experience could be different to yours. So what lens have you got on today? So their lens in them when they go out experiences something different than you're going to see. So, if you, so when I go to places with my white colleagues, like if you and I went to, for a drink somewhere, we might, I might feel different in that place that we're in, the tea shop, for example, being people don't look, there's not a lot of people who look like me there, which isn't a bad thing. But then does that mean people are going to see me for a, a, a friend of yours having a cup of tea with, or the woman over there who, who kind of stands out because she doesn't mix in, you know, mm-hmm. do it make sense? So sometimes I call them like areas that are quite beige, beige <laughs> being like non multicultural I've been to loads of places in England and some of them are not beige. And sometimes I really feel a bit uncomfortable and nervous. Mm-hmm. Um, I say that more with Brexit prior to kind of COVID when I used to go out, I, I felt really uncomfortable. Once, like I thought I was going to be attacked. Mm. You know? where per, you would never have thought of that. Maybe if it's a, somebody's making you feel uncomfortable in an intimidating way, of course you would. But, you know, intersectionality is important as well, isn't it? Yeah. All those layers. What, what thought would you like to leave people with? Maybe some sort of practical ideas about the things that we can all be doing kind of every day to, to try and tackle this. I think it's checking yourself unconscious bias that's the that's first starting point like I mentioned so how would you feel if your nephew your niece or nephew your child or son daughter brought home a black person partner and naturally how you'd feel that is your that is your real answer isn't it because it's emotional and it's personal so once you experience that the next thing you've got to be thinking of is okay well have I got any um personal friends or in my life from childhood to now have I you know had genuine experiences with somebody of a different color, you know, that I, that was positive rather than fighting algae and da da da. Okay. So all those little things will make, that's your checks, isn't it? Your internal checks, I think. And with that, you know, your answer, don't you? Then you'll know where and why you're doing what you're doing. And then what you need to be doing to make that effort of trying to, you know, recognizing I've been carrying this all my life, i.e. my values, moral compass. Yeah. Um, and now I'm, I'm understanding what it means you know because i've got the white privilege i've never thought about it until now and the more we get on the better at that and become the kind of the, you know the whole allies thing um being an ally in it then the more we're going to actually be that person to make an effort to sit nearer to that person to make them feel like actually fine because i could tell you now i've been that person felt excluded for a long while 
people don't sit next to me at conferences because I'm an ordinary person until they introduce my name. Do you understand? Yeah. Um, so it's just those little things of making a difference, making people like me feel included, not, you know, make us feel visible, not invisible. Um, smiling, just nice little things, you know, it just makes a difference. And I've seen people making a difference since Black Lives Matters in giving you eye contact and smiling. Morning. You'd be surprised. That's just like respect for me rather than expecting me to jump, walk out. You know, even when you're going down the street, people expect you to walk out of their way. Why do I also have to walk out of your way? And if I don't, then I'm in the wrong. Do you understand? There's loads of little things that you kind of, I think that white people take for granted again, that we expect to do things. Otherwise we're the aggressor when actually we're both equal here. We're both people and we should respect each other.